The next topic on the agenda is uh, the uh, second consultation that was published uh, recently, namely on Euribor fallback rates for cash products. And also here there will be an, answer, an opportunity for questions afterwards with an enlarged panel. Uh, but we uh, are starting with uh, Christian Gau, Anna Kozjevnikova, and Neil McLeod uh, of respectively Deutsche Bank Generali and Erste Group, who will uh, guide us through the uh, consultation. Uh, yeah, so Christian, let me start. I give the floor to you or Anna, who wants to start? I'll give it a start and we're going to hand over, I think, even several times. So hopefully everybody can hear me and see me. I'm, that is always the question, the key question yeah, today. I can guess. hear and see you perfectly. Okay, wonderful. Thank you very much and uh, welcome to all the participants, all the participants of this roundtable. Um, I will, uh, um, uh, Anna, Neil and myself will lead you through the presentation and then uh, we'll kick off with the Q&A afterwards. So the objective of this consultation paper uh, was predominantly, uh, or was twofold actually. So on the one hand, uh, the idea was to um, uh, demo, to uh, uh, have a look at the Euro S at the Euro SDR based term structure methodology uh, assessed against a list of key criteria uh, to be used as a Euro fallback rate. So, and uh, the key criteria is uh, one of the most important elements here because uh, with that uh, consultation, obviously, we're trying to achieve a neutral look uh, at the possibilities, at the pros and cons of each of these methodologies uh, in order to um, provide alternatives to the market participants and allow them to provide us with their proper feedback uh, of what their preferences are. That's what we're after here. Uh, the second element of this uh, consultation is the so-called spread adjustment methodology. That spread adjustment, we'll, I'll, um, we'll look at this in a bit more details um, uh, over the course of the next minutes uh, of, of, of this uh, presentation. But basically, this is uh, the methodology that allows to align Euro STR and Euriba, uh, given that they are looking at different tenors. Obviously, also different uh, risks are associated, and uh, the methodology here is aiming at um, providing a compensation and therefore uh, allowing. Um, to address a potential value transfers that would otherwise be irrelevant. So, therefore, at the end of the day, we propose, want to propose, be able to propose to uh, the market, um, also to uh, conventions, in order to calculate the corresponding compounded term rates. That is another um, element uh, which we will be, be which we will be closing off uh, at the end of the presentation. So the, um, the three main considerations relevant for this consultation and for the work in the, in the, in the corresponding working group has always been uh, that the uh, Euriba fallback rates must be based on Euro SDR, uh, that they um, cover uh, cash products, because we're going to uh, have a look at the derivatives, but basically from our point of view, derivatives are covered by the work that has already been performed by ISTA and has been uh, now feeding into their um, uh, a supplement uh, 70 of the 2006 ISTA definitions, uh, as, as well as uh, various amendments to clarify uh, implications on certain products. We will have a look at this uh, in a few minutes. Um, and the, uh, um, the uh, third element was that we would also always want to acknowledge the work as that has already been done uh, in the different market associations, uh, the recommendations uh, in other risk-free rate working groups uh, uh, in other jurisdictions, as well as, of course, the FSB rec uh, recommendations. All of that was to be included in the paper, and I think it clearly is. Um, um, important here, the paper is based on the current legislative framework. Um, so there is, it should be noted here, uh, that the uh, European, Commission uh, European Commission published a proposal uh, for uh, an amendment of the BMR which will address also and designate or is aiming at designating replacement benchmarks. So what we're looking here is um, basically the current framework and has not tries to incorporate any of these changes that will come up from there. So on uh, page 16, so let's move on to page 16. Yeah, um, let's start uh, with the methodologies. So the term structure methodologies. We basically differentiate uh, between backward looking and forward looking methodologies that we analyzed. Uh, and um, in this um, uh, presentation here, I will only look at uh, those alternatives which we um, 
finally settled for um, and therefore um, disregard any of the other um, uh, methodology uh, alternatives uh, that the working group definitely also looked at. You will find that in the consultation, but not in this presentation here due to uh, timing. So the backward looking term structure, what does it actually mean? Um, I think most of you have been looking at this already in detail, but only a quick review. Uh, the base case that we're always looking here is um, that we're looking at an observation period uh, um, as well as an interest period um, that refers to the past instead of the future as we typically find today when we're talking about uh, URIBA or all the different LIBORs. So the uh, normal case or kind of the standard case would be that observation period and, uh, and, and interest coupon period is the same. However, the start of kind of all developing all these alternatives is basically uh, the uh, fact that this is very, very difficult and uh, to, in terms of oper operationally very difficult and provides a number of challenges uh, uh, to build this into the workflows that you find uh, within the banks today. So therefore, what are the alternatives? How could we address these issues that basically occur from an interest payment to be made for a period basically at the end of the, uh, uh, of the coupon period? So on the same day, so it's the same day interest period, uh, in interest payments, so to say. So what we're, the alternatives that we have are threefold. Uh, we have, we're dealing with a potential, we're dealing with payment delay, a look back uh, and a last reset. So what does that actually mean? The first alternatives, so payment delay and look back are looking uh, um, or are applying backward looking in arrears patterns, whereas the uh, last reset method looks at it in advance. So what does it mean? Payment delay means that um, which, which simply only delay the interest payment itself. So observation period and interest period still the same, we're just delaying the interest payment actually. So um, at the end of a maturity of a deal that could lead to the funny effect uh, that you have a nominal payment on one day and the interest payment on another day, depending um, on the number of days, uh, the number of days that you choose the payment delay to be. You see that that um, contains kind of some operational issues or that they say could potentially trigger some operational issues right away due to now these two payments potentially being uh, hap or happening on a different date. And an alternative to, uh, for that, and that is the alternative uh, that, uh, for example, ISTA choose in their default um, uh, fallback uh, methodology uh, is the look back period where you now slightly um, uh, detangle the observation period and interest period. So you're looking at, a, at, a, at, a, at, a, at an observation period that is, to refer to what ISTA has been uh, deciding in terms of the number of days, two days uh, in the past. Yeah? So your observation period starts two days before, uh, um, uh, uh, for, before the interest period, actually. So, and that gives you the possibility to um, uh, deal with the operational issues uh, of the corresponding settlements. Um, then the last uh, method uh, that, we're, or that we're looking at here today in terms of backward looking methodologies, term structure methodologies, is the uh, last reset method. That is a methodology that even though it uh, refers to an observation period uh, that is uh, in the past, it is not the same observation period as the interest period. So therefore it allows you to use or to refer to a period in the past and apply it to an interest period in the future. So therefore you can determine an interest rate in advance, uh, which is uh, uh, an, an advantage uh, which we'll be focused on in a second, uh, but you're looking uh, at an observation period uh, in the past still. So therefore it tries to combine kind of the pros and cons of uh, these two different approaches. Yeah, um, forward-looking term structures, uh, I will pass on to, um, uh, in, in a second, to Neil in order to cover that. Let me just quickly, quickly and uh, we therefore move uh, only temporarily to page 17. We will return to page 16 when we look at forward-looking methodologies again. However, um, on page 17, what you find is now the way that we looked at these um, uh, term structure methodologies systematically. So the key criteria that we developed, key criteria that you find in here is, um, um, you, find, uh, you find it here, uh, listed on the left side here, that is robustness and uh, availability. What does it actually refer to? Uh, robustness and availability refers to um, whether um, a, um, uh, a methodology or 
kind of uh, yeah methodologies anchored in an active and deep and liquid underlying market um, as well as uh, um, uh, or how would it work in more adverse market conditions um, the criteria actually refers to the methodology immediate and the daily availability of the market participants so therefore it kind of tries to um, capture is this is that a stable methodology suggestion then uh, the operational ease that's i think i referred to that already when we were talking about uh, well how do we actually deal with um, an interest payment that happens at the end of the in, of the uh, of, of the interest uh, or let's say the payment that happens at exactly the end of the interest period so that is an operational issue so the question here is well what operational um, uh, implications do all these terms of structural methodologies have in terms of uh, how easy is it to implement in IT systems what are the skills and knowledge necessary and how how difficult it is to um, up to uh, change all the corresponding procedures client accept acceptance is the next assessment and uh, here we differentiate between professional market players corporates and uh, small and medium enterprises and consumers I think it is important to differentiate between these because you see already in the results that we have here categorized in four different uh, um, uh, four different color codes. Um, I'll lead you through that in a second. Um, the different customer categories have different um, intricacies. Uh, they are they are uh, they have different requirements and also different possibilities. Whereas professional market players. Uh, would probably, probably do not have an issue uh, with the operational challenges of uh, backward-looking methodologies. Um, uh, SMEs or consumers uh, definitely um, uh, have limitations, uh, or sometimes we uh, even face um, uh, or regulatory or, or consumer protection um, restrictions that sometimes uh, need to be looked at in a different way for this customer class. So client acceptance, therefore, is an important uh, element of the uh, um, of the assessment of the term structures. Then um, the uh, hedging ease and hedge accounting impact. That's actually very important at the very moment in time where you're looking at uh, the uh, uh, relationship between um, hedging on the one hand uh, mm -hmm. and the corresponding underlying transaction on the other hand. Um, should you come to the conclusion uh, that there is a um, large discrepancy uh, between um, these two, between the hedge as well as the underlying transaction, we might have an impact or might face an impact on hedge effectiveness um, in term, in when you look at um, uh, hedge relationships uh, within larger portfolios of uh, large, uh, of, for example, of mortgage loans versus the corresponding hedges. So for uh, um, what we then also looked at what the working group uh, um, focused on for uh, quite intensively is well, what is the what is the impact of that and um, um, what is uh, can we address any potential discrepancy between the hedge on the one hand and the underlying transaction on the other hand by the introduction of basis swap and uh, basis swaps and what would that mean um, um, as a direct consequence for the hedge effectiveness uh, let's not go uh, into too much details on that, but uh, you see it's very important definitely to look at um, the impact of these methodologies on hedging and the uh, corresponding accounting impacts. Everything that is not covered uh, then, in, let's say, in, uh, in, in a hedger accounting uh, has been looked at uh, when um, dealing with the other accounting impact category. Um, last but not least, we do have um, the risk management category that means what we're looking here is clearly um, how easy it is is it um, to apply risk management of, uh, using these different term structures uh, and um, what are the implications uh, and uh, what is the impact on IT systems uh, and the corresponding risk evaluation models uh, when um, dealing with such a uh, suggestion last uh, the consistency with other jurisdictions is an important element uh, because uh, um, EURSDR and EURIBOR is not uh, alone or is not should not be treated in a completely different and separated way. So we should, um, as far as possible, trying to align ourselves to other jurisdictions and uh, what they have been uh, or there's the, the terms or methodologies that they have been uh, suggesting uh, and looking at. 
yeah, um, let's go one step back and have a look uh, at the same type of analysis for the forward-looking methodologies. I pass on to Neil in order to cover that segment. Thanks very much, Christian. Um, so, uh, Christian very well described the, the, the backward-looking methodologies that, that I think everyone on the call will, will have uh, some understanding of. Um, what's the difference with the forward-looking methodology? And the forward-looking methodology is, is really about the expected interest rate rather than the actual interest rate. So it's trying to measure um, at this point in time what that rate is, is going to be rather than what it actually is. And that fundamentally um, starts causing some challenges because it means that you can't simply take um, uh, the rate that is there or the rates that are there and, and, and compound them, um, which is why a forward-looking rate, whilst optically looks easier from an operational standpoint, actually has an awful lot more challenges um, when you look at the methodology. So how or what can you use to try and measure that, um, that expectation? Basically, the derivatives market. So you, in some fashion, have to reference the derivatives market. In previous consultations by the working group, we concluded that um, the OIS swap market was the, the most sensible market to, to reference. And there you immediately have the challenge of, um, you know, what data should you use, exactly how it should be measured, um, and then what are the specific market dynamics around it. Um, the working group looked at three different important points, really, in terms of what was necessary for um, a, a forward-looking rate methodology. Um, as been already mentioned by, by previous panellists, we need to have this successful transition from Eonia. Uh, to Esther um, in the swap market, in, including the, the significant um, movement um, of liquidity, which, which we would still expect. Um, secondly, it needs to then be referenced based on a transparent and regulated underlying derivative market, um, trading, for example, on, on an MTF. And then you really need to have um, sufficient sources of data um, to capture most market activity whether that be real underlying transaction data um, or, or other options that have been considered in the past. Um, now, uh, the working group has, has, has been or has had presentations from five different potential administrators who um, have shown an interest in, in providing this rate. Um, uh, but as yet, there is no rate available. And I think if I just, just run through this, this table um, briefly with regard to, to, to forward-looking rates, um, why did we conclude what we concluded with, with, within these traffic lights? So um, the, the most critical topic, I think, is the robustness and, and availability of a forward-looking rate. As I've said, at the moment for the euro, there, there isn't one available. Um, for, for, for sterling, um, hopefully one will be available uh, at some point early next year. Um, the, the, there's obviously some beta rates or, already available. Um, one additional challenge within the, the, the Eurozone um, and specifically the uh, Ionia or, or, or ESTA derivative market is there is a limited number of counterparties which really dominate that market. Um, in terms of providing liquidity, in terms of volumes that go through. This would really need to change or, or, or adjust um, for, for it to become um, more robust or, or viable. Um, I think as well, uh, as I've already mentioned, the, the, the challenge is then making sure that really the market data is available in some fashion, whether that be transaction-based or something else. Um, but maybe the most important point, and just to remind everybody of the statement from uh, the Financial Stability Board, um, that uh, clearly a backward-looking rate will be more robust uh, than any of these forward-looking rates um, that, that could be available. And so where it is possible, um, the backward-looking rates should be used. Um, now, going through just the, the, the highlights of, of, of the other um, uh, criteria we considered. I mean, obviously, the big advantage with this forward-looking rate is that it's very, very similar in logic to current Uribor. Um, and so operational ease and, and, and client acceptance 
um, it, it is, is clearly green. Um, there are additional challenges with regard to, to, to hedging. Whilst the, the, the forward-looking rate that a cash um, product could, in theory, reference um, would be there, the derivative would still reference the, the backward-looking rate, which is, is basically still built from the same market, but creates uh, a limited amount of basis risk. Now, this basis risk, um, in theory, could be hedged, and uh, whilst it may create um, also hedge accounting issues, um, a basis market could could develop here to be able to manage that minor risk. But it would be very one-sided and, and, and isn't available certainly at the moment, uh, which, which is why we, uh, we concluded as a working group that it would be feasible with some minor changes or, or, or drawbacks. Other accounting impacts we see as, as, as limited really, again, because it's a similar source of methodology. Um, and, and the risk management impacts similar sort of issues with regard to this additional basis risk that, that, that we'd be embedded between um, the derivative and, and the cash product, if that cash product referenced a, a forward-looking rate. And then finally, with regard to consistency with, with other jurisdictions, asset classes, well, it's actually a similar picture, um, what we see elsewhere in terms of other working groups. What, what they have seen is that there are a number of challenges creating these, these forward-looking rates, but they see a clear need um, for, for certain asset classes to, to have this available, which we will talk about um, more in the following slides. I'll pass back to, to, to you, Christian, maybe just to summarise on the um, backward-looking methodologies. Yeah, yeah definitely. Um, so what you... When you go through the same that Neil led us through with respect to the forward-looking methodologies, uh, then uh, I think, Neil, you already mentioned uh, that from a robustness point of view, obviously, there is some advantage with the backward-looking methodologies, and that applies to all the three uh, um, uh, kind of uh, alternatives that we looked at. So payment delay look-back period as well as last reset. Uh, then with respect to op operational ease, uh, I think that is uh, where um, I, what, I, what I already mentioned uh, kicks in. So therefore, we uh, looking, uh, we we're always looking uh, at the fact that you need to settle uh, the interest payment actually very close to the end um, of your observation periods. So the number of days difference between um, um, your your the the, calcul the end of your calculation period. Uh, and the moment that you have to settle is always very close and provides challenges of, from an operational point of view. And that is uh, true not only for banks, uh, but also for the corresponding customers. Um, so therefore, we uh, looked at uh, that, so the operational ease of these methodologies uh, as uh, still feasible, but with some or some minor challenges for sure. Uh, and that would be true for the last reset uh, period more than it would be for the payment delay and the look back period. So looking at the client acceptance, uh, I already touched upon that as well. Uh, for professional market players, it should actually not be an issue um, uh, to accept backward-looking term structure methodologies. Uh, when it comes to corporates, um, it becomes, uh, I think the picture becomes slightly different uh, because um, uh, you, you still have that communication issues with these corporates already in terms of the, the what rate is actually being used and when can you communicate that information and how can you settle that uh, with these corporates. So it becomes already an issue. So therefore, the client acceptance, we believe, uh, for um, corporates in terms of the payment delay. So the, those two methods, uh, which looks uh, at, uh, uh, which applies in arrears method, uh, methods, uh, would only be uh, feasible with some uh, or some relevant uh, changes or drawbacks. Um, when it comes to consumers, uh, so to the uh, end consumer, uh, then it's, uh, I think, ultimately clear that you need to address um, consumer protection issues. Uh, and those, uh, I think that's what we found out, um, sometimes do not allow uh, you to um, not let or not inform the clients of the uh, rate that you apply to a certain interest period in advance. So, and that is uh, therefore that's therefore a restriction, which are, well, not a restriction, but a, a, let's say a limitation, which applies here, which need to be taken into consideration carefully, which led us to believe that from a um, uh, with respect to the payment delay methodology, um, it is quite questionable whether you can apply that for this type of customer, for this customer group. 
uh, and uh, with respect to the look back period, uh, which obviously provides um, a slightly better approach and is also in line uh, with what ISTA has been determining for the corresponding hedges, um, it should be feasible with some or relevant changes. Uh, the last reset methodology in that particular case uh, is actually feasible. So therefore, the most appropriate relevant only looking at client acceptance. That is just simply because uh, you actually determine that rate now in advance, even though you refer to an observation period in the past. However, you address that particular issue that I've just mentioned. So then for hedging ease and accounting impacts, uh, clearly um, the last reset methodology um, provides the kind of the, the, the biggest challenge because um, in this particular case, you have now, um, you, you separate basically between observation period and interest period. Um, so it's basically you, the observation period is the interest period, pre, uh, it's a pre, uh, say the interest period as of um, a bit before, yeah? predecessor basically. Uh, and that clearly indicates that those two periods do not relate to each other anymore in a way uh, that you would typically assume uh, uh, let's say the uh, observation period and the interest period relates. So therefore, it is important to understand here that that causes uh, issues with respect to hedge accounting uh, and could there and therefore we uh, um, classified this as uh, uh, the feasibility as questionable. However, the other two methodologies uh, in this respect um, do not provide the same challenges. And that is, uh, I should probably kind of mention that here, uh, that uh, the analysis which we did on hedge uh, uh, effectiveness, um, I think what, what I think the two important uh, uh, things to mention here is clearly that for the inclusion uh, of any measures to address um, the difference between coupon, uh, between the observation period and the interest coupon period by the use of basis work, for example, it is important to understand um, whether that is a direct in the consequence of the IBO reform as a first alter, as a first precondition, and the second precondition uh, whether economic equivalence uh, is um, uh, is given, uh, uh, and that means uh, equivalence before and after the reform should both be in place. And uh, we believe, based on the work that we're doing here, and based on the recommendations that hopefully we'll be able to give and to provide after. Uh, the consultation that should actually form part um, of um, the, as the assessment of economic equivalence. So it is therefore our assumption uh, that, that, uh, that these two methodologies will not have as much in, uh, of an impact on uh, hedging and hedge accounting, uh, and therefore uh, they, are provide feasible they are to be treated as feasible methodologies. Um, other accounting impacts very much same direction. Yeah? So, um, um, and um, therefore I will not focus on it too much. On the risk management impacts, um, why do we have uh, questionable feasibility for the last reset? This is simply because it's more difficult to hedge. Uh, you now have a situation where your, uh, as we said before, your observation period is in the past uh, and your coupon period uh, is in the future. So they deviate from each other. You definitely have to apply um, you have to treat this uh, from a risk management point of view in a different way. You need to uh, apply hedging, uh, most probably using basis swaps. However, basis swaps of the nature that we're looking at here might not uh, are not available yet, and a uh, market will have to be developed. So all of this, whether this uh, all of this will be available, is uh, at least to some extent questionable. That's why we look at this. Uh, um, uh, we believe that this is uh, uh, that the feasibility of this is questionable. Uh, and uh, with respect to the consistency with other jurisdictions, I think is the, the look back period, of course, is important to note here because that is the most feasible option, simply and clearly because it is widely accepted already. And that goes back to the work that ISTA has been performing by choosing uh, this methodology to be uh, their default uh, term structure, uh, the default uh, fallback methodology. So looking at that, uh, obviously, uh, that clearly indicates uh, that let's say that started um, let's say or that that took care that there this is to be treated and seen kind of as a as a default standard and therefore going for uh, the look back period uh, as term such a methodology clearly has the advantage of uh, of that being in line uh, with uh, what we saw in other jurisdictions and asset classes like derivatives for example. 
yeah, that is the uh, um, analysis of the, um, the backward looking methodologies in terms of these key criteria. Uh, and in the next section, we will lead you through um, what we call the use cases. So how does that apply to the different product classes now? Uh, and for that, I hand over to Anna. Thank you, Christian. Thank you, Neil. <clears throat> so um, based on, on, on the set of different criteria that uh, we, yeah, please come back to the slide. Yes. <clears throat> the working group analyzed um, uh, the applicability and viability of different uh, methods uh, or methodologies, backward looking methodologies or forward looking methodologies uh, uh, for uh, different, different products. Um, and uh, uh, we try to define a quite extensive list of uh, different assets and products for which we try to understand uh, which of these methodologies uh, can be proposed <clears throat> as, a, as a viable viable fallback rate. Um, if, uh, if you look uh, at the mapping uh, of uh, different colors presented by Neil and um, Christian uh, on the previous slide, uh, so basically the conclusion, considering first of all the availability of the rate uh, and also the assessment of, uh, uh, of the rate uh, by different criteria, the conclusion was that uh, for the major part of the products, the backward looking look back period term structure uh, could be considered as a viable and uh, uh, the most appropriate fallback uh, to be proposed. Uh, here I would like to uh, highlight uh, the main reasons and elements uh, why um, that are quite common for many products and that I would like to, to highlight uh, uh, on this slide. Uh, first of all, the backward looking look back period uh, allows still to have a quite good match between the interest period and the observation period. Of course, we are going to have a difference in terms of the look back uh, period, in, in terms of the look back uh, period days. Uh, uh, but uh, it, it still uh, provides a good, uh, good approximation and good match, especially if we compare it to the last reset method. On the other hand, uh, the, the look back period itself uh, allows uh, market participants to uh, perform all necessary calculations in terms of payments, in terms of settlement, in terms of uh, interest calculation or reconciliation and so on. What we can observe now in the market, uh, we have already some uh, products, in particular bonds or loans issued <clears throat> with, uh, based on this methodology. And uh, uh, what we can see is that the look back period varies from two days to five days. Of course, five days allows, uh, again, I mean, to, to, to perform more easily all necessary calculations and to have more time to perform all necessary reconciliations. But on the other hand, two days is much more in line with what is proposed for is the derivatives. And uh, this is an important element to be considered because it should help to avoid or to reduce any uh, hedge and effectiveness and actually to be uh, fully matched with, uh, with the approach uh, uh, proposed as a fallback uh, for this kind of derivatives. Um, in general, I would like to, to anticipate because this, this section is going to be covered a little bit late, um, that the working group um, didn't uh, propose any um, any recommendation or uh, any um, any look back period uh, in, in general because on one hand uh, we believe that uh, this is something that can vary based on specific product needs on uh, specific uh, market uh, sector requirements. And uh, uh, on the other hand, uh, it's uh, this is something that uh, again, I mean, can can vary based on uh, even on specific uh, 
uh, market participants needs whereas a certain product for example must be hedged or instead uh, the hedging effectiveness has uh, much less relevance compared to uh, to any other assets to any other product so this is something uh, that, that is discovered in the consultation paper but on which we uh, don't ask for any feedback and we don't plan to um, to come up with any recommendation another element to uh, that was i already mentioned uh, is related to uh, to the hedging effectiveness uh, so the look back period term structure methodology is the same uh, the, that uh, uh, was proposed by by ISDA, and uh, uh, this uh, has a quite significant weight for assets or products that are used for hedging or that uh, uh, that must be must be hedged. Um, Another element to be highlighted here is a consistency with the other jurisdictions. And uh, this is really important, as Neil and Christian uh, were mentioning. Um, in general, uh, we, uh, as a working group, we try to, um, to analyze uh, uh, and to identify <coughs> possible proposals uh, in order to um, not to increase any fragmentation in the market. So uh, for the market to be transparent and uh, uh, easy to operate as a fragmentation risk uh, um, must be mitigated to, to the extent possible. So this is an important element to be considered on one hand to, for example, to be aligned with what is uh, proposed for, for the derivatives. On the other hand, should help to reduce uh, the requirements, operational requirements uh, for IT systems, any new implementations, uh, any, any, any changes that these fallback rates might require in terms of uh, uh, operations or uh, procedure adjustment and so on. So <clears throat> this is another element to, to be considered and um, to, 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 in order to also to avoid to have any significant risk management impacts because again, I mean, uh, one of, um, of the requirements uh, that uh, was uh, had been already communicated in the past through different uh, report dedicated only to, to the risk management um actually was this one uh, so the necessity uh, not to introduce too many fallbacks and to try to reduce um any significant variability uh between between them so these are the main elements that actually uh led to <clears throat> conclude that the backward looking look back period term structure could be considered as the most um, viable as the most um, appropriate fallback rate to be proposed for many products. We can go to the next slide. And here we're talking about, in particular, corporate lending, debt securities, and uh, also a part of transfer pricing models used by most financial institutions. Um, then um, the working group recognizes that for some specific products or for some specific assets uh, due to their intrinsic uh, characteristics or due to specific use cases um, and here uh, again i mean if you if you look at the consultation paper you can find a quite good description of um, of different aspects especially in in the section dedicated to to the list of criteria presented before uh, and then of course also in the use case uh, section as well uh, so based on uh, on the criteria and based on what we have analyzed for different products, uh, uh, what is required by the market, how they're functioning and so on, the working group has identified some cases in which a different methodology compared to the look back uh, term structure can uh, be uh, required. And uh, this part is partially covered on this slide and then in, in the next slides. 
Uh, here, before passing the word to Christian for derivatives, I would like to highlight the first case is related to current accounts. And uh, um, as you may know, uh, the current accounts uh, and the market practice related to current accounts is quite uh, differentiated across different banks, across different countries or the European zone. And uh, uh, here, based on the fact that uh, actually uh, the balance of the accounts change from day to day and the interest can be calculated only uh, at the end of the interest period, not even before. So even knowing the rate in advance, this calculation cannot be done. For that reason, the working group uh, considered that the payment delay could be the would be the better option to be ad adapted for current accounts, but not the look back period. And this is the first exception that we have and on which we are asking also for your feedback in the consultation paper. For derivatives instead, please, Christian. Yeah, only a quick, I, I already mentioned it, only a quick uh, um, summary here. Uh, originally, we had derivatives included into the consultation, uh, but uh, given the developments um, on the ISTA side with respect to the de development of the fallback measures, um, uh, but also um, the continued guidance they provided on the applicability of that to different product types, which we were dealing with at the very beginning and were trying to address, uh, we didn't see any need for further recommendations, and that's why as I mentioned already at the beginning, derivatives are not included in the consultation right now. Uh, so I think that do, those have been already covered. So I think we move on therefore to the forward looking or is uh, uh, Yes, thank you. Yes, thank you, Christian. So let's move to, to the next two slides uh, that are quite, uh, quite interesting because there was uh, performed a specific uh, investigation uh, on products that may require the forward-looking term structure methodology. So uh, for which we believe the forward-looking term structure methodology will be um, the most appropriate choice. Uh, and then here I leave the road to Neil. Yeah, th thanks very much, Anna. So um, I, I've seen one or two questions that have already come up on this and I, I will then try and answer them um, through the, the next couple of slides. Uh, so th th there was clearly several product groups where we felt that the rate needed to be known in advance. So, so, so we concluded that for for mortgages, consumers, and SME loans, and um, for trade finance and for export and emerging finance, uh, emerging markets finance products, um, knowing that rate in advance was necessary. Now. That in itself doesn't mean that you need to have a forward-looking rate, because remember, we have one backward-looking rate methodology that would also be applicable here, the, the, the last reset. So what was concluded um, in terms of the, the recommendation um, is to introduce the forward-looking rate um, via a waterfall structure um, so that we would have uh, a backward-looking term structure methodology um, which would be the the, the, the last reset um, as a second layer of the waterfall in the situation that a forward-looking rate is not available, um, which clearly has has some some challenges around it still. So what we needed to construct and what we looked at within these case studies is is number one to say why is that rate needed to be known in advance, and then secondly. What are then some of the challenges with the last reset methodology? Because we concluded, yes, it would be possible, but it has some uh, additional headaches around it. So if we could go through to the next slide, please, um, where basically we've, we've, we've kind of summarized what the critical issues were. So for, for, for mortgages, consumer and SME loans, which we, we felt were in the end very similar in terms of the, the issues to consider, um, the most important point that we consider and is, is, is part of the questions that are there as well is um, what is a sufficient period of notice that the um, uh, end user needs to have? So, uh, and you can see it within the, the, the consultation, we did um, various analysis of uh, legislation, so consumer protection legislation across various um, jurisdictions within the Eurozone. 
if I were to summarize it, I'd, I'd, I'd give you two clear messages. It's either the rate needs to be known at the start of the period, or if it's not known at the start of the period, um, there should at least be a, um, a sufficient period of notice. Now, what isn't generally defined is what that sufficient period of notice should be. Um, so, so we considered this as well, and, and let's take the classic example of a, of, of a retail mortgage, um, because this, 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 this comes up frequently. Retail mortgage is, um, in, in many people's uh, cases, one of the most significant cash outflows um, during the month. Um, so we felt from that, at a very, very minimum, you'd want to know it at the start of the month. And in reality, you'd want to know it at the start of the interest period so that that individual can, can better manage uh, their cash flows. Now, the logic is actually similar when you move to other products and, 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 and also other client groups, which is why we felt something similar for, for, for the SME group. I think additionally for, for SMEs, which is the, the second bullet point there, is that a lot of financing is, is done based on a discounted cash flow basis. So you've got um, uh, the, that, that future cash flow that needs to be discounted to today. Um, if you're doing that, you need to know what that rate is um, at, at the start of, of the period. Um, so again, you, you need to know that rate in advance. Um, we looked at some other in, uh, aspects as well that had come up in the past with regard to, is there any sort of problem with the, the using a compounded rate? You know, compounding is in itself interest on interest, and there were some concerns about um, certain jurisdictions with, within the Eurozone. I, the, the conclusion was within the working group that this risk was, was, was limited, and um, if the rate is then, this backward-looking rate is then published, by um, the, the the central bank, so by the ECB, that risk is is even lower. Um, what we also considered uh, is kind of the, the the whether there's any major difference in terms of the understanding of the rate. Um, uh, conceptually, I think people wouldn't necessarily understand how Euribor is constructed um, in itself. And these methodologies, if you went into more detail, they become quite complex, especially the forward-looking rate. In that regard, um, we didn't see such a significant difference, but but clearly uh, it is easier to understand somehow um, the the, the backward-looking rate where you've got then um, simply compounding um, as a logic. So that was one group clear client group where we said there needs to be some form of notice in, in advance or at the start of the period, ideally. Other groups where we thought this was was, was relevant, um, trade finance, um, uh, an export and emerging, minor, uh, emerging market finance. Um, again, with regard to trade finance, it was similar to my example with the, the SME businesses where you're talking about discounted cash flows. And anytime you're talking about discounted cash flows, you really need to know the, the interest at the start of the period. With regard to emerging market finance, actually, it incorporated everything I've discussed somehow and, and, and more complexity. Um, often, the, the, the notice period from, from an operational standpoint needs to be much, much longer, um, uh, 30 days or, or, or more. Um, and the, the legal excuse environment... Excuse me. Can, I, also can I briefly interrupt? Yeah. Can I, I think we need to slowly move towards the end uh, of the of the panel uh, part and then and uh, switch to the q and a so if so I'll, I'll i'll thanks thanks william then I'll, i will i will speed up i will speed up and, and and pass on quickly yeah so um then briefly um that's the reasons why we need a uh, rate in advance last reset has a number of problems though so it can be used but feasibility for tenors longer than three months is a challenge. The economic mismatch is, is, is far, far higher if you say referencing six months, nine months, or even 12 months um, period. There are accounting issues, which actually is similar to, 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 to the um, mismatch in terms of economics with regard to the time value of money um, SPPI test. Um, systems and, and model requirements are far higher as soon as you're looking or using a, a backward-looking rate. And remember, that's far more significant when you're talking about, for example, retail products where you're then having to adjust core banking systems. And then there is hedging costs and complexity 
um, using the derivative market um, with regard to the the last reset methodology um, uh, sim simply because there is again some level of, of 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 basis risk which can increase the cost at the very minimum for for the end consumer. So um, I've su summarised there. I've sped up a little bit, um, and I think now I pass back to Anna. Thank you, thank you, Neil. So we can go to the next slide. And uh, here, um, there are also <clears throat> other uh, use cases uh, or other products for which we um, we propose uh, different different methodologies. The first one is related to securitization. Um, here, uh, we I mean, you may know that there is a strong relationship with uh, with the underlying assets. And uh, so, without going into details very briefly. Uh, what the working group believes is that the best approach is to apply the same fallback rate uh, used for the underlying assets. So it means that in case when the underlying the fallback rate for the underlying assets is based on the backward looking look back period construction methodology, the most suitable fallback measure to be applied also for uh, securitized products would be the same. So the backward looking back, uh, look back period term structure. Instead, uh, in case of uh, applying the forward looking term structure methodology for such products as mortgages or small, medium enterprise loans and so on. So basically the products uh, just covered by nail. Uh, in this case, uh, the most appropriate fallback rate would be um, to maintain the same rate, so the forward-looking term structure methodology, and always, as it was, uh, it has been already highlighted through uh, through the waterfall structure. Um, a quite um, uh, interesting point is related to to, to investment funds, uh, as you could see also in the consultation paper. Uh, we uh, haven't uh, reached any um, agreement or any proposal regarding the investment funds and uh, for, for for this kind of um, industry or sector, it would be important to have your feedback. Uh, of course, investment funds use the RIBA rate uh, for uh, mainly for two purposes. The first one, uh, buying or selling uh, investment products referencing Euribor, and on the other hand, uh, the Euribor rate is used also for benchmarking or for performance fee calculation and so on. So the main focus is on this second case, uh, uh, and. Uh, uh, there are two actual elements uh, that were highlighted by different participants on the working group regarding the use of uh, the benchmark within the investment funds industry. The first one is to, um, to guarantee that the rate is representative, so that the fallback rate is going to be representative of, of the market. And <clears throat> this is something that is covered by uh, by the consultation paper launched by the ECB and also uh, by, by the part related to the conventions of this consultation paper. And the second element is more related to, um, again, I mean, to, to the consistency, to the consistency of the fallback rate to be applied, to be used across different asset classes or different jurisdictions. So uh, these two criteria where I highlighted is the most important ones for the investment fund industry. But again, I mean, please, uh, we really hope to have your feedback uh, for uh, for this part of the consultation paper in order to, uh, to be able to come up with a clear proposal and recommendations. Um, so we can go to the next slide, and the slide just summarizes that what we have presented. Uh, you uh, you may see that uh, actually for many products we propose to use the backward looking look back uh, for the create and uh, for uh, for a quite significant part of, of of the products instead we believe that the forward looking trade 
um, can be really necessary to to have for you know, to uh, to due to specific uh, product characteristics or due to specific uh, use cases or um, client um, client needs. Um, we can go ahead. And uh, here, uh, there is a part dedicated to the spread adjustment methodology. As Christian was explaining before, we have two parts, actually, with the fallback rates. The first part is related to the rate itself, uh, based on the EURSTR rate. And the second part uh, of the fallback rate is related to the spread, spread, uh, spread adjustment to, to be applied, especially for legacy uh, contracts or legacy books. Please, Christian. Yeah, I try to be very quick with that. I think there is less uh, discussion around that part of the methodology. Uh, from our point of view, there seems to be um, more consensus on the use of the same methodology that is also being applied by the ISTA default Euriber fallback, which is the historical mean median approach to spread adjustment. Um, and uh, in general, that should um, applying that uh, the the, um, uh, the the advantage uh, doing that is that it reflects current market conditions. Um, it uh, allows not to uh, dive into any cliff effects. It considers uh, uh, the tendency of interest rates to uh, fluctuate around long, the long-term mean. Um, the information is already available, uh, and uh, it is also less impacted by temporary market distortions, given that you're looking uh, at the past and at quite a lengthy period. Uh, so therefore, we saw that it is broadly uh, that this methodology is broadly accepted, uh, and uh, hence we have included it uh, um, also, of course, in form of questions uh, uh, into the consultation. Uh, but we have limited, therefore, uh, the suggestions around that uh, from our point of view accepted um, uh, methodology. So I try to limit it as much as possible. Back to you, Anna. Or any, thank you, thank any you, Christian. <laughs> so we can move to the next slide, and this is the last, uh, the last part of the consultation paper. Um, so uh, here we try to analyze um, what kind of market conventions um, should be should be covered, or on which uh, we kind of need your your feedback. Uh, so first of all. Um, we, uh, the working group, uh, recommends to use the compounded average methodology uh, that, of course, compared to a simple average is more representative of, um, of the time value of uh, money. And uh, actually, uh, this is also this methodology is, uh, is proposed by, by the ECB in its consultation. Um, on what are the points on which we, uh, the working group is uh, looking for your feedback? The first one is related to, uh, to the publication of a spread adjustment or all-in rate. Um, currently, uh, as you may know, uh, the ECB doesn't plan to, uh, to publish these two elements of the rate. But on the other hand, we recognize that for some specific client needs or for some specific products, the publication of, um, of the spread adjustment or even of, uh, of an all-in rate uh, could simplify uh, either the communication towards uh, final clients or uh, either the implementation of these rates in, in IT systems and so on. So for that reason, uh, and you uh, will find uh, more details in the consultation paper, uh, we are asking for your feedback. Um, another point is related to the inclusion or not inclusion of a floor, so application of the floor to, to the daily Eurostar value. And in this case, uh, the working group strongly believes that um, the, the daily rate uh, should not be uh, adjusted uh, with a floor, but in case when a floor uh, should be applied, uh, it um, the most appropriate way to apply it directly to uh, the compounded term rate uh, plus, uh, plus a spread adjustment. Uh, because on one hand, it's going to be um, aligned with, with the current approach applied to the arrival rate. 
and uh, um, and uh, on, the other, on the other hand, of course, also should help to, um, to to simplify the introduction of this adjustment again. I mean, in in IT systems operations due to its consistency with the current practice. Uh, but again, I mean, uh, this is something that uh, we uh, we are asking in for for your feedback in the consultation paper. Uh, then uh, you will find also two other important aspects that we try to, to cover, explaining also um, why it's, it's important to clarify them and actually uh, where these aspects may have certain, certain impacts. So I'm referring to the last two uh, points of uh, reported on this slide and I leave the road to Neil. Yeah, th thanks, Anna. So um, briefly, compounding the rates um, versus compounding the balance. Uh, the main difference between those two methodologies, one then takes into consideration um, intra within an interest period fluctuations in the the, the principal amounts, um, and uh, the the other doesn't. So compounding the rate doesn't incorporate any fluctuations in the principal during the interest period. However, because it is a simpler methodology um, and has a wider, much wider application, we were proposing compounding the rate rather than compounding the balance methodology. Um, with regard to the look back uh, with or without an observation shift, remember here we're talking about um, uh, whilst the rate is, 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 is always shifted and um, to, the, to the earlier point, is the number of days also shifted? So with an observation shift, the number of days is also shifted without um, that, um, also known as the lag approach, it's not. Now, there is a, an important topic and there's, there's a good question on this that I will answer now if that's okay. Uh, because it then very much re relates to our conclusions here. So why is the backward-looking uh, look-back period term methodology for ESTA different from those recommended for SOFA and SONIA loans being combated in arrears with a five-day uh, look-back without observation shift? I think there are, there, there are two answers to that question. The first answer is that actually we said that both would be viable alternatives. Um, and we're very much aware that from a systems provider perspective, um, they have uh, uh, already built logic that uses the lag approach. But we looked at it at the two methodologies in detail, kind of independently from a system perspective, included that the observation shift was a was a better logic and was more consistent with the derivative market. Now, our understanding is that vendors are, are, are in the process of also being able to deal with the observation shift as well. And I think the important point um, within the, 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 the consultation is that both would be possible and we see both as, as really being quite acceptable. Um, that's, that's, I think, the, the summary. Uh, Anna, Christian, anything to add? No, nothing to add. And I think we've picked up already a few of the questions that we saw on our way to the end yes. of the presentation. Yes, no, nothing, nothing to touch on my side as well. Uh, of course, I mean, uh, we, we tried the working group tried to uh, to prepare quite a comprehensive and holistic uh, consultation paper. There are, of course, a lot of questions addressed in, in it, uh, but, uh, but again, I mean, uh, we really, it would be really important to, to have a feedback from um, a wide range of market participants uh, coming from different sectors or different industries. Um, especially considering the fact that we try to cover different products and different assets. Uh, uh, and uh, of course, I mean, with the aim to provide the market uh, uh, with, with the final, final recommendations um, for, um, for a quite, I mean, a comprehensive uh, uh, list, a list of, of products or topics uh, that we, we try to cover in it. So it it would be with really that, important. With that, I hope I can uh, now switch to the Q and A, <laughs> <laughs> if I may, because we are running out of time. Yep. So we have uh, uh, we have quite a few people lined up uh, to answer the question. I will not introduce them to you because you can see them on the screen. Uh, let me start by a question uh, that uh, I had, and that is uh, what uh, uh, and that is a, a question to the Commission. 
so that would be Tilman or Alessandra. How would you uh, uh, deal with a situation where you have multiple uh, replacements, uh, uh, recommendations for multiple replacement rates per type of product? And uh, when do you expect new legislation to enter into force? I don't know if Tilman or Alessandra could answer this, could this question. Yes, hello. Uh, so you will Hi, be Tom. really sure that we are still here. Um, uh, so if there are multiple uh, rates for different products, um, the um, designation powers do not exhaust with a initial designation. Um, it becomes then very granular, uh, but in terms of law, it is possible to um, determine a replacement rate for a particular category of products, such as debt, and then uh, have another uh, replacement rate for another category of products, um, if that is the um, stakeholder consensus and if the relevant risk free rate working groups convened by the various central banks in the different currency areas that decide to do so. Um, the second question as to the publication of a uh, statutory replacement rate. Uh, obviously, this is very much linked to the trigger. The trigger um, in our expectation would have to indicate exactly when the old rate ceases to be published on a permanent basis. And then we would uh, adopt the replacement uh, rate. Uh, so we would exercise the powers so that the replacement rate can then seamlessly enter into application uh, on the date that the um, previous IBOR rate ceases to be published. So therefore, the uh, regulators and administrators and the various um, agencies that can trigger um, the cessation would have to give sufficient notice uh, between their um, cessation trigger and the actual end of publications so that we could then uh, do the necessary work to either consult or to transform the recommendations uh, of a central bank a risk free rate working group into a um, replacement rate that will be an implementing act which will be adopted and then we will uh, make sure that the entry into application of that date coincides of course then with the last publication of the old IBOR. I hope that answers the question. Thank you very much. Um, as uh, I hope everyone can see, uh, we have a lot of uh, written uh, answers already, especially Jaap Kess of ING has been very active. Uh, let me take one question that has not been answered uh, by him or by anyone yet. And that is um, a question by Frank Scheel. And he's asking, why does the working group deviate from other working groups uh, regarding the application of a floor? Who would like to answer that question? Christian, Anna, Neil? I'm at the moment, to be honest, I'm not, yeah, I would really love to kind of hear more details as to why we believe there is a, I think we mentioned this in the conventions section. Yeah, so we have built kind of the, the question regarding how to incorporate uh, the floor uh, in the in the convention section, but other than that, uh, anybody remind me if I'm wrong. But we have not made any any uh, any conclusions there, if I remember correctly, right? Um, William, perhaps if I can uh, jump in, mm -hmm. if you can hear me, it's Cam. Um, uh, I don't know if this is relating specifically, uh, for example, to the loan conventions that have come out in the UK and the US, where it's envisaged that there's daily application. Uh, of a floor because daily calculations are envisaged and I, and I think where we've come out in the consultation paper is that it's um, it is accepted that for international consistency that you might wish to apply uh, a daily floor so it's not that that is um, sort of said that you can't do that uh, and it has been recognized that um, there is this interplay with the UK uh, and the US loan convention so I, I think that's probably aimed at the loan conventions uh, which are catered for um, in the proposals, but if it's something right. different, then um, Frank, please do write an additional question. Maybe, maybe I could add to to what Cam was saying. So our conclusion was was really from an operational standpoint, it was simply easier to take the overall period and floor the overall period. Um, but again, we we do state that that both are are, are clearly possible. 
um, within the consultation. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, another question is uh, asked by Franke Beisen. And he's asking, uh, or he's stating that it is surprising that on page 24, the group suggests two different methods, backward versus forward, with underlying assets, which are both cash financing oriented. And he considers this unusual. Who can answer this question? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm actually looking now. I'm looking now. It's page 24, and, and I don't see it going back. So I will I will send Frank uh, a personal mail to ask. Okay, what did what what does it mean? In, uh, and then we can come back to that. Very good. Uh, then uh, Patrick Scholl is asking: uh, Is it considered as part of the recommendations to reapply the forward-looking fallback waterfall structure for any of the subsequent interest periods? I, I could say that that hasn't that's it, it's uh it's an interesting question but it's not something that has been considered within the waterfall logic that we've uh, incorporated so far okay and then uh, i would like to suggest uh, that uh, i take the last question and again uh, we've uh, had uh, many uh, answers uh, also in writing in the q a box so uh, please have a look at those uh, uh, so the final question comes from Michael Hammer, and his question is, if the EU is going to mandate a replacement rate, how will it determine the most important part, namely the spread adjustment methodology? Will it do so by reference to working group recommendations? That would be for the Commission, I guess. Uh, yes, indeed. The answer is a straightforward yes. Uh, I think, as I said in my opening, uh, we would expect expect three elements to be in place uh, the base rate so that is a risk-free rate uh, compounded um, the adjustment spread to avoid um, the value transfer when it comes to legacy contracts and the uh, corresponding changes in the contract so how the contract needs to be changed so to accommodate that new rate which by the way uh, will never completely reflect the economic characteristics of the disappearing panel bank rate. Uh, so there must be also contractual modification, consequential modifications to embed that new rate. So if these three elements are in place, a RFR based uh, base rate, an agreed uh, adjustment to avoid uh, undue value transfer and the consequential changes in the contract, that's the elements that we would then take to determine a uh, statutory replacement rate. If those three elements are not in place, it will become very difficult. Uh, we would possibly, if we were minded to act despite that, have to put out the base rate, the spread adjustment, and uh, the corresponding changes for a very profound public uh, consultation. And we would then assess the ability to um, designate such a rate in light of the public consultation, the answer that we received, the stakeholder feedback uh, that is um, um, available. Uh, I have to say that we have a very, very clear preference uh, that this work is being done by the risk free rate working groups. And the fact that the European Commission has the opportunity to do its own consultation is really only yet another safety net of the safety net in case there is a particular uh, tenor um, which is not covered by an RFR recommendation. Thank you very much. And uh, with that, uh, I would like to uh, end the Q&A part. It's been a bit shorter, but on the other hand, we've had a lot of uh, questions answered in writing, and we will look at uh, open questions remaining to get an answer uh, to, uh, to everyone.